Darwin's Doubt, Part 7. Uh, this time because of time constraints and also because um, uh, there's an odd number of chapters in this part, I'm going to go over only one chapter. It's probably the one chapter that's most worth the while going over by itself. Um, Darwin's Doubt, the book itself, is written by Steve Meyer, author of Signature in the Cell, uh, oil industry geophysicist before he became interested in uh, um, the origin of life in particular and uh, the origin of uh, various kinds of life. He went and uh, got his PhD from Cambridge in the philosophy of science, specifically looking at this general subject. Uh, he has become the director for the Center of Science and Culture at the Discovery Institute. And the book is actually and a massive expansion of Meyer's article that uh, got uh, Richard Sternberg in trouble. Uh, for what it's worth, there's a lot of new material here that wasn't in uh, Meyer's article. He's obviously fleshed it out in there. Some of this is, uh, unless you were at uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the sessions that discussed the book. Uh, <coughs> science and human origins, uh, this stuff is new material and it's rather striking. Uh, the book itself looks like that. As you can see, we've stolen a little bit from the, uh, uh, from the front page for our background. The book, as the prologue says, is divided into three main parts. Uh, part one, the mystery of the missing fossils. Part two, how to build an animal. And part three, after Darwin, what? And again, we're going to go, go through kind of a Reader's Digest form of the book. There's a lot of stuff that I've left out, and there's uh, particularly interesting stuff that's been left out. But uh, So I encourage you to read the book rather than just take this for what it's worth. But it seems to be helpful to have uh, everybody kind of concentrate on, on the, the same issues. Um, the story so far, and this, these are my words, uh, trying to summarize part one. The sudden appearance of multiple life forms in the Cambrian was a major unsolved problem for Darwin. And the problem has only grown, grown worse with the discovery of the Burgess Shale and the Qingjing fossils in China. The excuse that the precursors were soft-bodied and therefore not preserved has been refuted by the evidence, at least the uh, evidence that uh, uh, the book brought forward in, in chapter four. Uh, claims that intermediates are really there, which is sometimes put forward popularly, but not so much in the scholarly press for obvious reasons, um, are lacking evidence and not believed by most authorities. Genetics seems to demand intermediates if the common descent is assumed. And if you have the tree of life, um, because of difficulties with the tree of life itself, it cannot be used as a counterbalance to the problem of the Cambrian explosion. And by the way, if you're discussing with somebody about the tree of life, uh, whether it's a unique tree or not, uh, this is a good chapter to look up, to find references, to go back and, and read, to um, help yourself understand and to help others to understand uh, whether that tree is as unique as is sometimes claimed. Um, and punctuated equilibrium cannot explain the Cambrian explosion because it requires very similar um, phenomena to that of the standard uh, uh, standard uh, Darwinian theory. And the only thing it can really explain well is stasis and then uh, sudden appearance. The reason why the Cambrian explosion is a challenge for Darwinism, the, we are now in part two, is that Darwinism has to explain the origin of massive amounts of information, not just Shannon information, but functional information. There's always been doubt that Darwinism was up to the job, but the work of Yaki, Sauer, and now Axe have made that job much more daunting. Steve Meyer then, uh, right after Axe's 
uh, work, wrote a paper that called attention to this work, only to see the paper put on a, what you could call an index, and Richard Sternberg kind of excommunicated. Uh, the only paper to attempt an answer to Meyer's article was an internet article. Uh, therefore, it's not in the published uh, uh, peer-reviewed literature, which has advantages. There is no controversy in the peer-reviewed literature. And it has disadvantages because if only peer-reviewed stuff is any good, well, this stuff is obviously not any good. Um, and that showed the article's main peer-reviewed support. Uh, pardon me. Meyer basically takes that article apart, showing that the article's main peer-reviewed support doesn't say what the article says it says. So um, we are now in part two, and we are in um, the chapter on complex adaptations and the neo-Darwinian math. And he begins with a fellow who's not well known, uh, unless you're in the area, but uh, apparently he's fairly enough, fairly enough well known uh, if, you, if you study that area. University of Illinois biologist Tom Frazetta knew the textbook story as well as anyone. According to neo-Darwinian theory, organisms with all their complex systems came into existence via natural selection and acting on randomly arising small-scale variations and mutations. Gradually, as a sort of continuous change, where one structural condition melts gradually into another. Rosetta had his doubts, however. As an expert in functional biomechanics, he had detected the skulls of snakes found on the island of Martyrius. In the Indian Ocean, these snakes, called bo bolerines, are boa-like, but have an anatomical specialization found in no other vertebra. Their maxilla is divided into two segments. Or actually, if you want to be technical, three segments, one front that's joined together, and two hind ones that are separate from the front ones. Um, linked by a flexible joint and serviced by many specialized nerves, extra bones, tissues, and differently arranged ligaments. This unique trait allows the snakes to bend the front half of their upper jaw backwards when they attack prey. Which means they have more range of motion. And um, here you can see the, uh, uh, the hinge uh, joint basically right here, which uh, means that the front end of the snout can bend up, um, whereas a standard snake just simply has the upper jaw and that's it. Could this complex system of bones, joints, tissues, and ligaments have evolved gradually? A movable joint dividing the maxilla into two segments, observed Frazetta, seems to have either a presence or absence with no intermediate to connect the two conditions. <coughs> As Stephen Jay Gould asked of the same system, how can a jawbone be half broken? Or as Frazetta himself observed, I find it difficult to envision a smooth transition from a single maxilla to the divided condition seen in boilerines. Yet the problem for neo-Darwinian theory Rosetta realized extended well beyond the anatomical peculiarities of rare snakes. Almost any biological structure of interest, the inner ear, the amniotic egg, eyes, olfactory organs, gills, lungs, feathers, the reproductive, circulatory, and respiratory systems possess multiple necessary components. To change such systems requires altering each of the many independent parts upon which their functions are based. This cannot be done willy-nilly. For example, changing any of the three bones of the mammalian inner ear, the Incus stapes or malleus, will perforce require corresponding changes in the other bones and in other parts of the ear as well, such as the tympanic membranes or the cochlea. Complex biological systems depend for their function on tens or hundreds of such independent yet jointly necessary parts. As the number of necessary components increases, the requisite number of coordinated changes increases too, rapidly driving up the difficulty of maintaining the functional integrity of the system while modifying any of its parts. 
And that was the problem, as Frazetta understood it. Any system that depends for its function on the, un on the coordinated action of many parts could not be changed gradually without losing function. But in the neo-Darwinian scheme of things, natural selection acts to preserve only functional advantages. Changes that result in death or reduced function will not be preserved. The integrated complexity of many biological systems thus imposes limitations on the evolutionary process, limitations that human engineers do not face when they design complex integrated systems. In 1975, Frazetta wrote a minor classic entitled Complex Adaptations in Evolving Populations, explaining this concern. He wrote, when modifying the design of a machine, an engineer is not bound by the need to maintain a real continuity between the first machine and the modification. Notice intelligent designers can get around this problem quite easily. But in evolution, transitions from one type to the next presumably involve a greater continuity by means of a vast number of intermediate types. Not only must the end product, the final machine, be feasible, but so must be all the intermediates. The evolutionary problem is, in a real sense, the gradual improvement of a machine while it is running. Now that's a good way of putting it. Historically, evolutionary biologists tried to solve this problem one advantageous variation or mutation at a time. Darwin himself famously employed this strategy to explain the origin of the eye, asking his readers to imagine a series of incremental advantageous changes to a simple nerve sensitive to light. As Frazetta thought about the problem of explaining the origin of complex systems, he came to doubt both the classical and the modern Darwinian accounts of such systems. Influenced by the Wistar outsiders, Murray Eden and company, he admitted revealing some hideous personalia in confessing that he was attracted to the worries about neo-Darwinism expressed by Murray Eden and other Wistar skeptics. Why does one confess that this is a hideous persona to question Darwinism? unless there's some kind of emotional attachment to Darwinism. Otherwise, you just, well, that's one theory. I just don't buy it. <coughs> Frazetta's concerns turned on the growing appreciation of genetic information. Though biologists then, as now, didn't fully understand how genetic information in DNA correlates or maps to these higher level complex morphologic structures, by 1975, they did know that many hundreds of genes can be involved in coding for a single complex integrated structure. Thus, altering the anatomical structure of the mammalian ear or the vertebrate eye, for example, would involve altering the genes that code for its constituents, which implies most implausibly that multiple coordinated mutations would occur virtually simultaneously. The doubts Frazetta expressed gained little traction in the evolutionary biology community because neo-Darwinian evolutionary biologists assumed that mutation and selection had nearly unlimited creative power, enough to generate even complex systems of the kind described in Frazetta's book. And you know, in some, the logic is, we're here, there is no God, there must have been evolution. Well, evolution must be able to do this and this and this. And if you grant the premises, the logic is, very difficult to refute. The mathematical expression of neo-Darwinian theory, population genetics, seems to confirm this conviction. Population genetics models how gene frequencies change as the result of processes such as mutation, genetic drift, or neutral changes, changes that don't help or hurt, and natural selection. The mathematical models of population genetics describe how much evolutionary change can occur in a given time, a period of time. Three primary factors, mutation rates, effective population sizes, and generation times. So there's, there's three factors that, uh, primary factors that are used. And there are other ones that can be used as well. Uh, evolutionary biologist uh, calculations seem to imply that standard evolutionary 
mechanisms could generate significant amounts of evolutionary change in many groups of organisms, even enough to build complex systems. As long as mutation generates a continuous supply of new traits, any system, however complex, can be built one trait at a time via the creative power of natural selection. Or so the story goes. Confidence in these mathematical models and their underlying assumptions led many neo-Darwinists to disregard the need to give detailed accounts of the specific evolutionary pathways by which complex systems might have arisen, uh, arisen. For example, in an evolutionary biology text widely used about the time of Frazetta first posed this challenge, evolutionary biologists Paul Ehrlich and Richard Holm advised, one need not to go in the details of the evolution of the bird's wing, the giraffe's neck, the vertebrate eye, the nest building of some fish, etc., as the selective origins of these and other structures and of behavioral patterns must be assumed to be basically the same in outline as those such as, in, uh, as those, such as industrial melanism. I'm assuming he's referring to the peppered moth, or they are referring to the peppered moth, which have already been discussed. Even a slight advantage or disadvantage in a particular genetic change provides a sufficient differential for the operation of natural selection. You don't have to worry about which genes came first to get that neck or the bird's wing. You just you've got a good story, you stick to it. You don't, don't have to have any details. Almost the justification for telling just those stories. <clears throat> Thus, the mathematical expression of neo-Darwinian theory seemed to certify the plausibility of even large-scale evolutionary changes. Again, provided these changes could occur one mutation at a time. But what if there are systems in living organisms that cannot be built one mutation at a time and instead must be built by simultaneous coordinated changes? What if building just a single new gene or protein requires such coordinated mutational changes? but of individual genes themselves, not just multiple genes, but one gene turns out to be complex adaptation. Uh, if you're hearing this, you're, you're starting to think be he irreducible complexity, and you would be right. Mathematical challenges initially did not dent confidence in the adequacy of neo-Darwinian explanations. That has begun to change, and it has begun to change in a way that has not only introduced a new mathematical challenge to the creative power of neo-Darwinian mechanism, but also in a way that indirectly confirms Axe's key insight about the rarity of genes and proteins. In the last decade, developments in molecular genetics and population genetics have exposed a connection between the problem of the origin of new genes and proteins and the origin of complex adaptations. As more biologists have recognized that connection, they too have begun to share Frazetta's doubt. Population genetics and the origin of genetic information. The neo-Darwinian synthesis was formulated during the 1930s before the elucidation of the structure of DNA. Not knowing the nature of genes, they also assumed that a single mutation could alter a gene in such a way as to produce a new trait. The equations of population genetics are predicated upon this assumption. You just have a gene, it has a mutation, it has a specific effect, and uh, that effect is selectable either positively or negatively. After 1953, a biologist no longer conceived of the gene as an abstract entity. The gene had a definite locus and structure, and that individual genes contain hundreds or thousands of precisely sequenced nucleotide bases. Now I have to say precisely has a slightly different meaning here, um, or should anyway, because there are some changes that we cannot detect that there's a difference. Whereas um, uh, there, there are some changes that do, are required to be precise. We saw that 5% uh, of certain proteins uh, required the exact amino acid in that particular spot and no other one would do. Biologists came to understand mutations as something like typographical errors in long strings of digital code. As a result, many scientists began to realize that individual mutations were unlikely by themselves to produce new beneficial traits. 
Some scientists realized that mutations were instead overwhelmingly more likely to degrade the information contained in a gene than pr to produce a new function or trait. This change of perspective called for an explanation of how mutations could generate new genes, an explanation that was provided beginning in the 1970s with the ideas of gene duplication, subsequent neutral evolution, and positive selection. Gene duplication did serve to buttress a critical assumption of the whole enterprise. After the 1950s, evolutionary biologists no longer assumed that single mutations would necessarily generate whole new traits. After the theory of gene duplication was formulated, many evolutionary biologists thought that a mechanism had been discovered by which sections of genetic text could accumulate multiple changes without compromising the fitness of an organism. Basically, you, have, you make an extra copy of the gene, and then the first copy has to stay exact, but the second copy can be allowed to vary all it wants to. Or vice versa, in which case the second copy becomes, in fact, the first copy. So when Frazetta confronted evolutionary biology with the problem of complex adaptations in the mid-1970s, most neo-Darwinian biologists responded with a collective yawn if they noticed it at all. But could a series of separate mutations generate new genes, the new genes necessary to build new proteins and new traits, or did building genes require multiple coordinated mutations? Are genes themselves complex adaptations? Classically, Darwinian biologists have assumed that small, separate, step-by-step -step changes could produce all biologic structures and features, provided each change confers some survival or reproductive advantage. In his chapter in the 1909 anthology, Darwin in Modern Science, the British geneticist William Bateson Riley describes how this widespread assumption prevented evolutionary biologists from confronting the real difficulty of explaining the origin of complex adaptations. By suggesting that the steps through which, an adaptive, through which an adaptive mechanism arises are indefinite and insensible, all further trouble is spared. While it could be said that species arise by an insensible and imperceptible process of variation, there was clearly no use in tiring ourselves by trying to perceive the process. If they're insensible, you can't find them, so why bother? This labor-saving council found great favor little uh, tongue-in-cheek there, I think. Um, in 1970, Maynard Smith wrote an article, um, that's John Maynard Smith, um, in Nature, responding to an earlier article by Frank Salisbury, a biologist from Utah State University. According to Salisbury's calculations, the mutational mechanism as presently imagined could fall short by hundreds of orders of magnitude of producing, in a mere four billion years, even a single required gene. So Salisbury is arguing you can't get the gene from the organism. And Maynard Smith is going to say, uh, to overcome this probability, Maynard Smith proposed a model of protein evolution. While admitting that the origin of the first proteins may remain a mystery, so who knows how the first one came. The origin of life is beyond our radar scope right now. He suggested that one protein could evolve into another as a result of small incremental changes in amino acid sequences, provided each sequence maintained some function at each step along the way. Maynard Smith used this example to convey how he thought protein evolution might work. And uh, the illustration he gives, he starts out with word, and he gets to gene by changing one letter at a time. And all of those are meaningful English words. Now, whether they will work in the same sentence is a whole different question. Um, Ariel. And do they have a superior advantage to the previous word so that you'll have survival of this population over the older population? Well, I think that the answer that most of these people would give is that you have uh, two different environments, and in one environment, word works better, and then in another environment, war works better. And then there's a third environment in which gore works better, 
that presumably a global warming environment. Um, and then, um, uh, then you go to um, gone <coughs> environment, and finally you get to an environment where gene is better than gone, and by that means you select the population in which, which, you, which you go. But you notice that this is all connected with changes that presumably are advantageous in <coughs> some setting for each organism. But uh, now, can you do that with real-time proteins or not? That's a whole different question. Well, and uh, after you had assumption upon assumption upon assumption, uh, you st should start looking for some other alternatives. But see, here's the thing. There are two ways you can look at this. One of them is, does this really explain it? In which case, I'd want to know well, which proteins do you think went through this? <coughs> uh, oh, all of them? Well, can you give me an illustration of one protein that goes to another? Um, pick a protein, get it to another protein, and show how it can be done in <coughs> seven easy steps, or three easy steps, or 15 easy steps, or whatever. Uh, we got another comment. Oh. And, and so th this, is the, um, th this is the argument. That, that's one thing. I if you're actually asking for an intellectual answer that will be somewhat satisfying, then you start doing research <coughs> as to, well, which proteins could go into which other proteins without losing function or keeping some kind of function all the way through a function that could be selected for. Now, the second way that this can work is we have a theory, and our theory requires certain things to happen, but it isn't obvious how they happen. <coughs> so if we can conceive of a possible mechanism that will allow it to happen, then we can settle back and relax because the problem is solved because we don't need the right answer of all we need is something that's plausible enough to where we can continue to believe it. Uh, it it's, it's a little different use of the same, uh, the same argument. And in that case, you don't need to check out your answer because all you need is some plausible <coughs> argument to, to deflect the critics enough to where you can feel comfortable maintaining that your theory is the best. Because your theory is really driven by other mm -hmm. things, perhaps theological considerations. But then you go a little further into the quantitative estimation of these changes and the short amount of time that you have in billions of years to do it, you have a further problem. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. but you're getting, you're getting too picky. Thank you. Uh, Maynard Smith explained the words in this analogy represent proteins. The letters represent amino acids. The alteration of a single letter corresponds to the simplest evolutionary step, the single mutation, and the substitution of one amino acid for another, and the requirement of meaning corresponds to the requirement that each unit step in evolution should be from one functional protein to another. Again, this is just a general argument you can make a case out of it, but I'd sure like to know how it works out in real life. Maynard Smith realized that natural selection and random mutation could only build new biological structures from pre-existing structures if each intermediate structure along the way conferred some adaptive advantage. So these should be relatively easy to find if they really exist. How, he asked, could one gene or protein evolve into another if such a transformation requ required multiple simultaneous changes in the basis of the genetic text or arrangement of amino acids. Here's how he described the potential problem. Suppose that a protein A, B, C, D exists and the protein little a, little b, c, d um, would be favorable if by, favored by selection if it arose. Suppose further that the intermediates uh, little a, b, c, d and a, little b, c, d are non-functional. These fo forms would arise by mutation, but would usually be eliminated by selection before a second mutation could occur. 
the double step from A, B, C, D to um, capital, uh, all capitals A, B, C, D would thus be very unlikely to occur. I think I would have phrased it the other way, but that's the way it came out in the book. So, As he explained, such double steps may occasionally occur, but are probably too rare to be important in evolution. And I would agree with him, and by the way, this is why uh, people attacked Michael Behe as strongly as they did. They realized that he was hitting on a critical problem. Um, if there are really irreducibly complex steps, then um, you can't get from here to there without unreasonable amounts of luck. Biochemist H. Allen Orr pointed out in 2005 in Nature Reviews Genetics, although Maynard Smith's works appeared early in the molecular revolution, his ideas about the problems facing protein evolution were almost entirely ignored for two decades. Um, reason being, he'd given enough of an answer to where people could believe that it was solved somewhere without having to, uh, without having to give a specific answer waiting for complex adaptations. In 2004, Michael Behe and University of Pittsburgh physicist David Snoke published a paper in the journal Protein Science that returned to the problem first described by Maynard Smith. In his 2004 paper, Behe sought to extend his critique of neo-Darwinian theory, neo-Darwinianism, by uh, assessing its adequacy as an explanation for new genes and proteins. He and Snook attempted to assess the, the plausibility of protein evolution in the case that it does indeed require multiple coordinated mutations, whatever those might be. They applied standard neo-Darwinian models of analysis derived from population genetics to make their evaluation. They considered the plausibility of the main neo-Darwinian model of gene evolution in which evolutionary biologists envision new genes arising by gene duplication and subsequent mutations in the du duplicated gene. So this requires two steps. One, to duplicate the gene. Two, to start mutating the gene to where you need it to go. Behe and Snook assessed the plausibility of this model for multicellular organisms in the case that multiple, two or more, point mutations must occur simultaneously in order to generate a new selectable gene or protein. Now, in other words, if there's only one that needs to be changed, then it's pretty, it's not that hard to see how that could happen by chance. Behe and Snoke first noticed that many proteins, as a condition of their function, required unique combinations of amino acids interacting in a coordinated way. For example, ligand binding sites on proteins, places where small molecules bind to larger proteins to form larger functional complexes, typically require a combination of several amino acids. Molecular evolution by University of Chicago evolutionary biologist mm -hmm. Wen Sung Lee says, uh, acquiring a new function may require many mutational steps. And a point that needs emphasis is that the early steps might have been selectively neutral, non-advantageous, because the new function might not be manifested until a certain number of steps had already occurred. This is a classic statement of irreducible complexity. You need more than one step to get there. And uh, in this particular case, he's suggesting that you need several steps to get there. And the first, let's say, three or four or whatever, don't really make any difference in function. So they can't be selected for. <coughs> Behe and Snoke point out that this observation implies that a series of separate mutations could not generate a ligand binding function in a protein that previously did not have this capacity. Since individual amino acid changes would initially confer no selectable advantage on the protein lacking this function. Instead, evolving ligand binding capability would require multiple coordinated mutations. Behe and Snoke make a similar argument about the requirements for the evolution of protein-to-protein -protein interactions because both proteins have to match in that case. <coughs> and in order to make them match, they have to be carefully crafted to do so. So many changes, so little time. Behe and Snoke asked, how many coordinated mutations is it reasonable to expect in a period of time 
given various population sizes, mutation rates, and generation times. Then for different combinations of these various factors, they assessed how long would it, be how long would it typically take to generate two or three or more coordinated mutations. They determined that generally the probability of multiple mutations arising in close, that is functionally relevant coordination to each other, was prohibitively low. It would likely take an immensely long time, typically far longer than the age of the Earth. He has a long hist uh, thing on the Powerball lottery, which I'll omit. It may be helpful for especially people who uh, need a little brushing up on their uh, 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 statistics. But uh, the basic point behind this is that if you're going to win at Powerball, it helps it depends on the odds of winning to begin with. It depends on how many people are buying tickets or how many tickets you buy, if you want to put it that way, make it personal. And it depends on how many series of Powerball are you willing to play through in order to, uh, uh, in order to win. Are you going to keep at it for 50 years, 100 years? Um, if you die at 100 years old, well, obviously, that's the end of your Powerball. Um, <clears throat> Behe and Snoke found if generating a new gene required multiple coordinated functions, then the waiting time, that's how, how many <coughs> games you play, would grow exponentially with each additional necessary mutational change. The more balls in the Powerball, the less likely you are to get all the matches you need, and therefore uh, the more you have to play, and at some point it'll be longer than your life. They also assessed how population sizes, that's like how many tickets you buy for each Powerball game, um, affected how long it would take to generate new genes. They found, not surprisingly, that just as larger populations diminished expecting waiting times, the more tickets you buy, the more likely you are to win, smaller populations dramatically increased them. The fewer <laughs> tickets you buy, the harder it is to win, the more time you're going to have to play the game. Just to give you a crude example, 100 Powerball tickets bought at one time are roughly equivalent to one Powerball ticket bought for 100 different lotteries. More important, they found that even if building a new gene required just two coordinated mutations, the neo-Darwinian mechanism would likely, be, likely either require huge population sizes or extremely long waiting times, or both. Behe and Snoke found that mutation and selection could generate two coordinated mutations in a mere one million generations. Of course, one million generations is 20 million years if it's, you're talking about humans. Well, maybe 10 if you're talking about proto-humans that presumably have kids at 10 years old. Um, but that's still more time than we have uh, between us and chimps, uh, according to the conventional wisdom. Um, but that was only a population of one trillion or more multicellular organisms, which is may, way more than the number of people that are supposed to be on the Earth. Uh, estimates for population is more like um, 10,000 to 100,000 people on the Earth at one time uh, during prehistoric times. A number that exceeds the size of the effective breeding population of practically all individual animal species, including humans, by the way, that uh, have lived at any given time. Conversely, they found that mutation and selection could generate two coordinated mutations in a population of only one million organisms, but only if the mechanism had 10 billion gen generations at its disposal. Yet, on the assumption that each multicellular organism lived only one year, 10 billion generations computes to 10 billion years, more than twice the age of the Earth. <laughs> now, of course, if you're a bacteria, that's fast, it d does faster. But then you have to remember, if you're dealing with uh, multicellular organisms, uh, 10 generations per year is really, really fast for most uh, multicellular organisms. Behe and Snoke did, however, find one tiny sweet spot in which a gene requiring only two coordinated mutations could arise. And we'll show you that figure in a minute. Uh, such a gene could conceivably arise from one billion organisms in a mere 100 million generations. Since many more than one billion organ multicellular organisms have lived on Earth during its history, and since multicellular life on Earth has existed for more than 500 million years, these numbers offer, assuming again one year per generation, that 
the prospect of enough time in organisms to generate one new gene. Only one new gene if only two coordinated mutations are necessary. And uh, here's the, um, you can see if you go up to two, right in this area here, um, if you're approaching 10 to the eighth organisms, that's 100 billion. No, correction, that's uh, 100 million organisms. Uh, 100 million years, I'm sorry, that's the time. And uh, the organisms is 10 to the ninth is 1 billion. You say if you have 1 million, you, you're not going to get there until you reach 10 to the 10th years, which is way too long. And uh, you can see how all of these um, work out. Behe and Snoke found that if generating a new functional gene or trait required more than two coordinated mutations, let's just go back and look at that. Supposing you have three. Well, here's three. You can see that if you're restricted to less than a trillion organisms, um, then it's not going to happen for 100 billion years. <coughs> uh, pardon me, 100 million years. Uh, 10 to the ninth would be about to here. So 1 billion. Once you get out to here, you're exceeding the age of the Earth uh, in conventional terms. And um, unless you have 10 to the ninth organisms, it's not going to work. And for bacteria, those are reasonable populations. For humans, for trilobites, probably not. Behe and Snoke found that if generating a new functional gene or trait required more than two coordinated mutations, then excessively long waiting times were necessary regardless of the size of the population. Thus, they concluded that the mechanism of gene duplication and point mutation alone would be ineffective, at least for multicellular species. It ain't going to happen. The edge of evolution and its critics and <coughs> This is one that we talked about in uh, Don't Mess With ID. Behe and Snoke are well-known critics of the creative power of the neo-Darwinian mechanism, so their conclusion might seem suspect to some observers. Nevertheless, evolutionary biologists attempting to defend the creative power of the neo-Darwinian mechanism have inadvertently confirmed Behe and Snoke's conclusions. Two recent scientific publications tell this story. First, in 2007, Michael Behe published a book the Edge of Evolution, amplifying the results of his 2000 paper with David Snoke. Um, using public health data about a genetic trait, resistance to the anti-malarial uh, anti uh, drug chloroquine in the one-celled organism that causes malaria, Behe provided another line of evidence and argument to support the conclusion that multiple coordinated mutations are often necessary to produce even minor genetic adaptations. In the case of chloroquine, it apparently takes two key mutations at least. Based on public health data, Behe, and this is actually an error in the book, Behe copied somebody else who had determined uh, in another peer-reviewed article that resistance to chloroquine only arises once every 10 to the 20th malarial-causing cells. He called this trait a chloroquine complexity cluster or a CCC. Behe wanted to explore what he called the edge of evolution, the limits of the creative power of mutation and selection at the genetic level. Having established that this trait could arise by random mutation in a reasonably short period of time, he wondered how much time would be required to produce traits of greater complexity in populations of various sizes. What if you did two coordinated CCCs well, Behe showed that the problem of coordinated mutations was particularly acute for longer-lived organisms with small population sizes, organisms such as mammals or, more specifically, human beings, and their presumed pre-human ancestors. Behe estimated, based on the relevant mutation rates, known human population sizes, and generation times, the time required for two coordinated mutations to occur in the hominid line, and the answer was many hundreds of millions of years. Here the story gets really interesting. Two Cornell University mathematical biologists, Rick Durrett and Dina Schmidt, attempted to refute Behe's conclusion by making their own calculations 
Their paper, Waiting for Two Mutations with Application to Regulatory <coughs> Sequence Evolution and Limits of Darwinian Evolution, also applied a model based upon population genetics to calculate the amount of time necessary to generate two coordinated mutations in the hominid line. And their calculations um, suggested that it would take not several hundred million years, but only 216 million years to generate and fix two, or two coordinated mutations in the hominid line. Well, of course, 216 million years um, is a little more than uh, one would usually assume. Um, in seeking to refute Behe, Dirt and Schmidt inadvertently confirmed their, his main contention. As they acknowledge, their calculations implies that generating two or more coordinated mutations is, quote, very unlikely to occur on a reasonable time scale, end quote. So, you know, hundreds of millions versus 200, mil uh, 200 million, you know, what's a few hundred million between friends, it's certainly not five million, which is the traditional splitting time between humans and apes. <coughs> uh, testing the co-option option. But does generating novel genes and proteins require coordinated mutations? Some neo-Darwinists have proposed a model of protein evolution known as co-option. In this model, a protein that forms one function is transformed or co-opted to perform some other function. Presumably a little bit at a time, but maybe it has to have several mutations before it finally catches on to the second uh, uh, function. And how many... How many mutations can you do? Well, of course, what they've been arguing so far is that you can only do one, maybe two with lots and lots of luck, and that's it. This model envisions new features requiring multiple mutations arising in a step-by-step -step way to produce some protein, uh, call it protein B, from some other protein that lack these features, call it protein A. In proposing a series of single separation muta separate mutations, advocates of co-option propose that initial changes might have allowed protein A to perform some uh, other advantageous function, perhaps a C function or a D function and then E function in series and then finally getting around to get back to B where you wanted to get it to in the first place. Thus making it selectable as C and D and E before you get to B and preventing protein evolution from terminating due to a diminution or loss of its initial function. It's still useful so the cell won't get rid of it. Eventually, as mutations continued to generate new proteins with slightly different functions, they would have generated a protein close enough in sequence and structure so that just one or very few additional changes would suffice to convert it into protein B. Aware of these imaginative scenarios, Douglas Axe and his colleague, molecular biologist Ann Gager, now working together at the Biological Institute in Seattle, decided to put them to an ingenious experimental test. In so doing, they sought to determine whether the evolution of new multiple site features does indeed typically require multiple coordinated mutations, or instead, whether such a feature could arise by co-option. Can you do this one step at a time, or does it have to be done all at once? Axe and Gager scoured protein databases looking for proteins that are as similar as possible in sequence and structure, but that nevertheless perform different functions. They identified two proteins that meet these criteria. One of the proteins, KB, I think that's 12, is needed for breaking down an amino acid called threonine. And the other one, BioF2, is needed for building a vitamin called biotin. And uh, figure 12.6 is, uh, those of you who were here for Science and Human Origins will remember uh, pictures like this that were perhaps even more accurately drawn. And you can see the very, very similar proteins, you know, have alpha helix here, alpha helix here, a little bit of an alpha helix here, alpha helix here. Um, there's some slight changes in this area here. It's mostly the same protein. Gager and Axe realized that if they could transform KB12 into a protein 
performing the function of BioF2 with just one or very few coordinated amino acid changes, then that might demonstrate, depending on how few, that the two proteins were close enough in the sequence that a conversion in function of the kind envisioned by co-option advocates is plausible in evolutionary time. If, however, they found that many coordinated mutational changes were needed, then that could establish, depending on how many were needed, that the Darwinian mechanism could not accomplish the functional jump from A to B in a reasonable time. If proteins that perform two different functions have to be even more similar than KB12 and BioF2 in order for mutational changes to convert the functions of one to the other, then for all practical purposes, co-option would not work. There simply aren't many known jumps that small. It's, it's sort of like, here's two peaks, mountain peaks. The question is, is there a ridge between them that you can walk along without having to dip far enough into the valley to get um, drowned, shall we say? Um, or is there, in fact, a big dip between the two that is not bridged by any kind of ridge going in any particular direction? Indeed, Axe and Gager's experiments showed that the smallest realistically conceivable step exceeded what was plausible given the time available to the evolutionary process. In their words, evolutionary innovations requiring that many changes would be extraordinarily rare, becoming probable only on time scales much longer than the age of life on Earth. If I remember correctly, they mentioned seven different changes that were necessary to get from the edge of one function into the, the other function. Now, what this all means according to Steve Meyer. By showing the implausibility of the co-option model of protein evolution and the need for multiple coordinated mutations in order to generate multi-site features in proteins, Ax and Gager confirmed that genes and proteins themselves represent complex adaptations, entities that depend upon the coordinated interaction of multiple subunits that must arise as a group to confer any functional advantage. Indeed, by applying mathematical models based on the standard principles of population genetics to the questions of the origin of genes themselves, Behe and Snoke, Durrett and Schmidt, Schmidt in inadvertently, Axe and Gager, and other biologists have recently shown that the generating the number of multiple coordination mutations needed to produce even one new gene or protein is unlikely to occur within a realistic waiting time. The math and the mechanism. There's a concluding irony in all this. The researchers calculating waiting times for the appearance of complex M adaptations mm -hmm. have in each case done so using models based on the core principles of population genetics. They're doing population genetics just like everybody else is. The mathematical expression of neo-Darwinian theory. In a real sense, therefore, the neo-Darwinian math is itself showing that the neo-Darwinian mechanism cannot build complex adaptations, at least beyond a certain point, and that point is demonstrable, uh, reasonably demonstrable, in uh, present biology. Including the new information-rich genes and proteins that would have been necessary to build the Cambrian animals. To adapt a metaphor that Tom Frazetta might appreciate, the snake has eaten its own tail. Now, my own take on this, I think that population genetics has destroyed drift as an effective mechanism for getting new functions in larger animals. Not in theory, but in practice. Even in bacteria, it has sharply reduced the viable pathways to new functions. Bacteria must be rewarded every six amino acids or so. If they're not rewarded that fast, then it takes too long to evolve a new gene except for once or twice, maybe because of luck, large mammal mutations must be rewarded every single step of the way. And the fact of the matter is we haven't found pathways like that, and when we've looked, they don't look like they are there, in fact. But that's my opinion. Now you get to talk. Uh, we have two of them over here. Anybody over here? Oh, mm -hmm. we've got three of them over there. Well, I'll tell you what. After Ariel, then we'll go to uh, 
Danilo, uh, Danilo mm -hmm. and um, and uh, Dr. Gladden. Yeah. Uh, this confirms, of course, what uh, we've known for years and years, uh, that you cannot, uh, there is no mechanism for complexity in the neo-Darwinian system, uh, except for a very minor, simple changes, uh, like uh, adaptation to antibiotics and so on at, at that particular level and where you have huge populations. But uh, I, the one aspect that I think this chapter probably uh, could add to the, to the uh, enigma is the extreme complexity of advanced organisms compared to simple ones. They're dealing here with very simple changes, very simple and simple organisms and so on. Uh, man, I, man has a thousand times more genes than uh, E. coli, something like that in that region. Uh, you're you're going to have to do an awful lot to, to get all these changes in, in, in the, and in the time necessary, you know. Uh, th this borders essentially on the impossible, and I think the case is essentially closed. Why not look for some other alternatives when you face such improbabilities? I, I have to agree with you on that. Um. It strikes me. I was I was just in my mind as I was listening to this. I was thinking about some some way to save the mechanism, and then I was thinking, well, what about if the bacteria were really, because of their relatively short lifespan and uh, fast turnover, were really the generators of new genes and then passed them over to higher cell forms or, or something like this. So uh, this is called massive lateral transfer. Yes, yes. Uh, the problem is that that invokes, you're basically supposing that bacteria are able to do that um, because of their much uh, faster generation times and uh, much more prolific <laughs> uh, numbers. Um, but then, in order to have all of this functioning, you're, you're talking about development itself being functional. It, it's, it's not just that the final product has to be functional, but every stage of development has to be functional as well. Uh, for example, if you suddenly have bacteria that, that produce something that gives them uh, new traits that, that may be useful to a higher organism that they happen to inhabit, uh, you have to uh, somehow be sure that the new trait bacteria are not now going to become dangerous to the organism to which they're going to pass the trait to. You know, so in some sense, the task that we're up against is not merely producing a functional final product, but rather the task of having a functional development of the product. It's, you know, we, I'm, I'm thinking it's, right it's, now it's of a car. It's modifying the engine while it's running. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's kind of like I'm thinking right now of a car that we need to replace because our car got totaled. And wouldn't it be nice if we could just buy a little package someplace and grow the car from raw materials, like watering it in the backyard, and always have a backup car so whenever a, a car gets totaled, we'll have one just in time, ready to roll. Or, and, or would it be it nice has to have to a, be a car parts tree? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it all has to somehow assemble just right. And it has to work, and it has to work at every stage of its development uh, in, in order to 
be uh, ultimately usable. <coughs> uh, th this, this is somehow a challenge. I used to think that, you know, people used to uh, explain evolution by way of um, development. They would use uh, expressions like ontogeny uh, is recapitulated. Uh, phylogeny. Phy phylogeny recapitulates. Uh, onto ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. Pardon so. me. Okay, yeah. excellent. Yes, thank you. <laughs> but but sounds you, wonderful. you see, that, that, that it sounds wonderful, but the more you think about it, is, it's, it's, um, when you're starting with nothing, it's kind of hard to have the ontogeny in the first place, and it has to work every stage of the way. <laughs> How is this going to be explainable. I mean, we're talking mm. about it being difficult to begin with, and then we're trying to make it a, a developing system, which raises the complexity of the whole problem uh, many f orders of magnitude. Mm -hmm. Well, your idea of uh, a lateral transfer is uh, quite an interesting one, I think. And, uh, uh, the, the problem that I see with it is very simple, and that is that the bacteria are presumably being rewarded for having their own fitness, which may or may not correspond with the fitness of the individual organism that they're inhabiting and later to give this gene to. So, for example, if the bacteria are developing insulin for uh, an organism that needs it, um, never mind the fact that you have to have the insulin and the insulin receptor, uh, both being uh, both working, why would the bacteria want to do insulin when it's no use to the bacterium itself? That's, that's the problem with uh, farming the um, uh, develop, protein development department off to bacteria instead of having it reside in the, uh, in the uh, larger organism. As why do the bacteria care what the larger organism wants? Now, if you've got a human or some other intelligence that can understand what's going on, start to say, well, I want insulin, so I'll develop it first in bacteria, and then I'll transfer the gene to the, the organism. If you have some kind of intelligence that can make that work, then you can do that because the intelligence doesn't have to doesn't have to worry about whether the bacteria are better or worse off by, having to, by producing insulin. But if you, don't have the, if you don't have some intelligence guiding the process, then it kind of founders on why do the bacteria care what uh, the next step of the multicellular organism needs to be or not. I comment back here and then we'll come back. All right. Ariel. I'll preface my remarks by saying that I agree with you and I agree with Meyer that Darwinian evolution and neo-Darwinian evolution can't explain the complexity that we find in the structure and function of, of living creatures. Uh, however, uh, those two alternatives aren't the only alternatives that might offer an explanation. And even the explanation that Meyer offers repeats the misunderstanding of probability theory that I've mentioned before in my comments. His use of the power ball example is a complete misinterpretation of probability theory as it applies to random events, which presumably you're dealing with in the case of the power ball lottery. Uh, Let's say that the chances of winning at Powerball, I don't know if that's been computed yet or not since it's a relatively well, it's new actually, development in the yeah, lottery. There's uh, five balls with 50 numbers on each one, if I remember correctly. So it would be 50 with, to the fifth but, power. But with the mega number, that complicates right, right. it. So let's just say, to pick a number out of the hat, that it's a billion to one. Or yeah. All right. Uh, so theoretically, then, you'd have to have uh, sell a billion tickets to be sure, reasonably sure, that to have a probability of one that you'd have a win. Right. It doesn't matter whether a billion people on Earth buy a ticket at the same yeah. time or that uh, serially you buy one ticket each game and play a billion games. 
either way, you'd get a probability of one. Actually, you get a probability of one over e. It turns out that yeah, uh, right. But <laughs> there's a long tail on this one. But here's the thing that we need to notice: time doesn't enter into this at all. If you have a billion tries, either simultaneously or successfully, uh, successively, you probably will have a win with a probability yeah. of one, as you say. Or yeah. And th that, of course, is the advantage of farming out this problem to bacteria is because there's so many more tickets being sold. Of course, but let me finish my mm -hmm. point here. However, that does not mean that the win is, can be predicted on any particular try. You're just as likely to win on the first try as you are on the billionth try, or any try in between. The probability is exactly the same. Of course, the misunderstanding of that is what, keep, what keeps people buying lottery tickets. They say, well, I've been playing 20 years I'm bound to win sometime soon now. Not at all. The ticket you buy after 20 years is no more likely to pay off than the first ticket. That is true. Time has absolutely nothing to do with true random sequ yeah. uh, populations or sequences. Causal chains are entirely different. And most processes in nature tend to be a mixture of both causal and random. That's right. Uh, gene mutations, micromutations appear to be random. On the other hand, the kind of protein and amino acid changes you're talking about right. involve causal chains, and not just causal chains where A follows B and B follows C, but intersecting causal chains. And in most cases where we're dealing with life and the functions of mind, we don't even know all the causal chains that are involved, mm -hmm. and we don't know what random events may intervene. You can diagnose someone with stage four cancer and say they have six months to live, and, uh, you would be wrong every single time. A random event can pop in and they'll die half sooner. Half the time they'll die sooner and half the time they'll die later. Or a woman gets pregnant and you say you can calculate the date, 200 and so on, when the child will be born. It may be born, you know, uh, two months early or two months late. Uh, mostly we're dealing with that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. So usually these mathematic, mathematical models they come up with don't really apply to the actual events. However, the point I really wanted to make here is there's one kind of process involved in both the functions of life and the functions of mind and probably in the functions of inanimate nature in what we call cosmological evolution, uh, which has to do not with structure at all but with interaction of functions. And there's a whole new science beyond population genetics that's developed in the last couple or three decades called complexity science that deals with what happens when you have a group of structures that have assigned functions, but those functions are f interacting with one another in terms of interrelationships. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that as they interact, new levels of complexity emerge that aren't predictable as the sum total of the interactions of the individual uh, items that make it up. This is the basic premise of complexity science. And on that assumption, then uh, take the human brain, for example. It's assumed, that, except mm. perhaps for the amygdala, where you do have generation of new cells and some other areas that approximately the same number of cells exist as birth as exist in adult life. But the number and that each one of the cells can have as many as 10,000 connections to other cells through synapses so that you get tw quadrillions of possible interconnections. But uh, most of those aren't functional in the infant. Uh, however, a great many that are functional get pruned as it, uh, you develop. But by the time you reach adult life, you have a level of complexity and a level of adaptability and a level of storage that isn't even animated at all in the infant that has about the same number of brain cells. So clearly, uh, this whole kind of analysis, which assumes that we're dealing with the causal effectiveness of structures, neglects the interaction of functionality itself. I, yes, go ahead. I'm going to add a footnote to what Lee said. Um, I'll just mention the biologist camera, you know, their work, 
and poly in terms of uh, seriality, synchronicity, and Alfred White North Whitehead. Okay, so I'd like to go into that myself a little while later, but I think another time, but I think you follow me on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But, uh, my point really in summary is that we've moved beyond population genetics and in, in effect we're talking about something that's <coughs> obsolete and we now are, have to talk about complexity theory and decide whether it arises from intelligent design, whether it can be explained in terms of causality, whether it can occur randomly or because of the interaction of two or all three of those possibilities. And uh, I've been reading your book, enjoying it. Well, thank you. And very much uh, all of the chapters that I've looked at have been very invigorating intellectually. And uh, I'm really now on the nature. Mm -hmm. Oh. And uh, I've found, found it most, uh, most edifying. Thank you. Okay. I have it here with oh, me. Thank you. <laughs> if we move beyond uh, causality, we're going to lose uh, rationality. I think we need to watch carefully where we're going there. I didn't say moving uh, beyond so causality. Yeah. I said moving beyond structure as yeah. the only yeah. cause and not recognizing yeah. the causality of yeah. functional interactivity. Uh, but uh, coming back to uh, uh, observable biology, uh, you when you look at this situation that uh, Myers raised here and these other scientists have raised, I think they have a case. Um, supposing you wanted to, uh, to get to a, uh, another example uh, uh, beyond their many examples, supposing you wanted to evolve somewhere in the evolution uh, between uh, an ordinary uh, bacterium, might say, or whatever, uh, uh, first life uh, that was on earth to, to man, you're going to have to develop some bones uh, along the way. Uh, and supposing you want to uh, evolve a bone. Uh, so you, you have a mutation that makes a bone. Well, it'll take a lot of mutations to do, make a bone the right size and so on. So, but that bone is totally useless. Uh, just have an extra bone sticking out uh, is not going to uh, provide an organism with superior uh, evolutionary uh, survival value. It's going to be something that's uh, uh, an impediment. That you need, for example, uh, uh, one thing it would be helpful to have bones with actual joints so that they can move on each other. Yeah, and uh, one thing would be helpful would be to have muscles that can act on you those need bones. muscles but well, mus ligaments to hold them together right. where they're supposed to be and that muscle is useless uh, unless uh, it has a nerve system connecting it to the brain that has a, uh, a system that uh, controls how much muscle movement you want uh, these are all things that are absolutely useless unless the whole system is there uh, in terms of uh, now that there are t situations where you may have some intermediate steps that are useful but in general new structures uh, have to be useful if they are going to fit uh, the neo-darwinian uh, uh, picture uh, and uh, we uh, uh, evolutionists are willing to admit this. Our leading evolutionists are willing to admit this. That this is this is you know a, hmm. a problem. And I think Meyer has done an excellent yeah. job of putting together this particular question. Well, as far as bones are concerned themselves, just the bone li leaving aside all the questions of muscles and t tendons and ligaments and nerve and control, and uh, there's the problem of uh, Bones require fairly specific uh, protein called osteocalcin. And osteocalcin has, well, first of all, it has its own structure. 
But secondly, it has a whole bunch of aspartic acids that have got an extra carbon carboxyl group attached to them. So you have to have not only the, the protein structure itself, but then you have to have a new protein to tack the extra carboxyl mm -hmm. onto each one of those acids in order to in order to form good binding sites for the calcium that's going to be calcium phosphate with a little bit of calcium carbonate mm -hmm. to go with it. It is always probable, you know, that uh, we go into other systems where uh, it could happen, you know, it, it is possible. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, let's be reasonable and pick the most probable versus the exceptional. Uh, truth ought to make more sense than error. Let's go down that road and pick that which seems most true. What, what, what seems to me a little bit, um, how should I say, um, difficult to fathom is um, why even the mere discussion of these kinds of issues is essentially ruled as being out of bounds by many. That, that in its own right seems to be something that really needs to be examined closely. Why should the, the mere discussion of whether or not evolution is the right explanation already be uh, the wrong uh, thing to do. How should I say? It's almost like um, you're immediately deemed to be attacking science by merely asking the question, how could this be? Um, that to me suggests a weakness. It does not suggest a strength. On that note, I think we'll call it a day. We will uh, be here next week. Um, we're past the first Friday night in November, but anybody who wants to is willing, to, uh, is able to come to uh, so Mickey Ask's house for the first Friday night. Okay. We'll be starting this on December 6th, so for those of you who can. Um, in the meantime, uh, we'll I'm going to try to see if I can get through the next two chapters and finish part two, how to build an animal, and then the ask the question after Darwin, what? And by the way, we will be getting into things like complexity theory d during the first part of that. Uh, uh, I, I believe that Stuart Kaufman, for example, figures in the, uh, in the first ch uh, chapter or so. So uh, it'll be interesting to see what happens. You know. One of the things I think we're gonna, I'm going to try to do is just to give you my idea. When we get done with this book, I'm going to give you my idea of uh, after intelligent design, what? In other words, we, we've spent a lot of time arguing to a designer. Right. Now we're going to turn around and say, supposing we accept that there's a designer, yes. where do we go from there? Because I think there is, uh, there are some interesting pathways along that exploration.